Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Church. It's good to see you all. I've been gone for the past couple weeks on vacation. Glad to be back with you. My name is Don. I'm the worship pastor here. If I've never met you before, glad that you are all here worshiping with, with us today. Everyone who's joining us online, we're glad that you are a part of this service. Thank you for being here today and joining us as we worship together. Later today at one o'clock, we are going to have a special meeting for anyone who is interested in going to Israel. We are going to take a pilgrimage to Israel this coming January. And if you are interested in going on that trip, we'd love to meet with you today at one o'clock. It'll be in the chapel. Also, if you're joining us online, it will be at one o'clock online as well. We are looking forward to sharing you, with you all this information. This is one of those, if you're checking it out type of meetings. It's not all the nitty gritty after you've already committed that kind of stuff. This is one to just help get you excited and help decide whether or not you want to go or not. We just want to give you a lot of information for that. So remember, today at one o'clock in the chapel. Also, you'll see the backpacks outside in Scripture Hall. We have backpack attack going on. Just go grab a backpack, fill it full of school supplies, and bring it up here, and we'll make sure it gets to the Christian Activity Center here uh, after the end of this month, after we complete this drive for backpacks. Also, out in Scripture Hall, you'll see a table for Feed My Sheep Ministries. They are out there. They've got a couple of things coming up. They've got a 5K run that they want to tell you about. They also have an opportunity for you to sign up to sponsor some uh, public school children uh, to help them with their public school needs down in Honduras. And we're also going to learn more about their ministry later on in a video during the service. Well, let's go ahead and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Uh, and let's go to God as we get ready to worship him this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. Another day and an opportunity to come into your house and worship you. Lord, we thank you for just the coolness of the room. We know as the day today gets hotter and hotter, we look forward to a, a break in the weather uh, and the heat this week. We pray for the hopefully the rain that is coming. And we just pray, Lord, that you will fill us with the rain of your Holy Spirit today. Fill our hearts and our minds with the things of you as we gather as your people today to worship you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I invite you to stand with me and let's worship our God together this morning. Cause we were the beggars 
and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Here we go. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. this morning.
Let's prepare our hearts to receive God's tithes and our offerings by going to him in prayer. Almighty God, thank you. Thank you for all you are, all you've done, all you have given us. We humbly come before you now, giving you thanks for all your provisions, for seeing to our needs, Lord. Now, as an act of worship, we return a portion of your tithes and our offerings to you. We pray your blessing upon them. We pray that you'll do great things in and through us, through the ministries of Christ Church, wherever those ministries may reach, down the hall, around the corner, or around the world. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may begin bringing uh, God's tithes and your offerings to the bowls here in the front. They're also in the back and in the balcony. You can also give online at mychristchurch.com. As you continue to do that, I invite you to be seated, and I want you to hear a little bit more about Feed My Sheep Ministries. Hi, Christ Church. I'm Reverend Shane. I am here with Bob Nelson, who heads up Feed My Sheep Ministry. It's a ministry that reaches out to the country of Honduras. It's been around a long time. So, Bob, when Feed My Sheep goes to Honduras, what do you do? We serve the people of Honduras. We have feeding programs, which uh, is a big need there. We do medical clinics. We uh, have a school we partner with, and we evangelize. Outstanding. On the evangelism end, uh, what, what kind of evangelism do you do? We... Um, hand out Bibles with uh, Bibles for Honduras, and uh, we knock and go door to door doing that. We hand them out at street corners, and, uh, and we share the word of Jesus. Our goal is to connect people with Jesus Christ. Outstanding, and, and you've also kind of planted and aided the ministries of some churches down in Honduras as well. We partner with uh, five churches down there. Uh, we have been uh, instrumental. The Holy Spirit has used us to construct a church that seats about 500 people. And we have feeding programs at all of them. And uh, we minister with all of them. Well, this is just isn't a ministry that, that we send money to. This is also something that you can be a part of. So maybe some of you are kind of hearing that ping right now saying, hey, this is something I connect with. Bob, when's the next trip? Uh, we're going October 20th to the 27th, and uh, Reverend Mike's going to go with us on that trip. And it's going to be a special trip because we are going to do extensive evangelism. We're going to put on VB three VBSs at our church. We'll have a couple medical clinics running. We're going to be all over the place, wherever the Spirit leads us. And, and Bob, I understand that in October, the temperature can get as cool as 190 degrees. Is that is that correct? It cools down to about 190 in Honduras. I've never been down there. <laughs> it hasn't been hot. <laughs> Bob, if, if people want to go, if they say, hey, I want to be a part of this trip, what do they need to do? We're going to have a ministry spotlight, and we'll be at the table to answer any questions that you have about going on the trip. Uh, I would encourage you to go on this trip. If you want to feel the Holy Spirit and feel the connection of uh, working for the kingdom, please come with us. And we'd love for you to do that. Are you feeling a ping? Here's your opportunity. Blessings. Surrender, you are brave. 
keep your crown. So I yield to you until you care for him. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you were making new wine. In the soil. scripture reading this morning. It is Psalm 4. Let's read it together responsibly and proclaim the word of God this morning. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? Selah. Lord, Lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There will be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart, more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. 
I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please take a moment and greet one another, and then you may be seated. the time. At the first of the year, right at Christmas Eve time, we had these, these red little stones. They're, they're located right here in a basket. And I asked those of you who are willing to make the commitment to Christ, to doing things Jesus' way in 2022, to come and get a stone and to put them in this jar. And, and those are your stones. Every Stone that you put in there represents a commitment that you've made. On top of it, we've had some prayer requests come in and we mark those with different kinds of stones, but it's sort of the, the memory of the greatness of God. You know, when we think of doing things God's way, a lot of times we think of praying, uh, coming to church, serving, giving, those type of things. But part of doing things God's way is doing things God's way 24-7, 365. Not the little things we add to our lives, but a life that tracks with the intentions of God. That is what we're gonna talk about today. If you did not have an opportunity or have not made the commitment yet to pick up a stone and put it in the jar, we're gonna give you a chance to do that at the end of the service. John 10, 10, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life, and have life abundantly. In this series, I have argued that Christians should be the most alive people in the world. It's all pretty easy when things are going your way. But how do you stay upbeat, positive, optimistic, and joyful in the difficult times? How do we keep dancing when we can no longer hear the music? How do we keep going joyfully when life seems to be squeezing every drop of joy out of us? What is the process by which God's people can maintain a joyful life? That is the substance of Psalm 4. So I'm going to encourage you to take notes because there's a, a very clear journey as to how we stay up when life is trying to bring us down. Now, for the purposes of this Series, we've got five definitions. Let's look at those. Number one, soul, the essence of every human being. Salsa, an upbeat, exciting, and dynamic, attractive life. Church, an exciting place where lives are transformed. Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, filled with spirit, passion, creativity, and life. And ministry, the heart-pounding, dynamic work we do as the physical presence of Jesus Christ. Many years ago, a former seminary mentor by the name of Reverend Harvey Palmer came up from Georgia to preach a revival for me in Lawrence County. Anybody from Lawrence County? I was going to say rural Lawrence County, but that was redundant. All of Lawrence County is rural. Harvey was an African-American pastor from Atlanta, and he'd had a rough life before Jesus found him. But man, when Jesus got a hold of him, he turned Harvey's life around. I loved Harvey, partially because he loved me, and partially because the man could preach the paint off the walls. He would preach on a Sunday, and you'd have to send the custodians to vacuum up all the paint. He was just a man who preached with everything in him. He once gave me one of the best compliments I have ever received. He said, you're the only student I've had here who could preach in my church. And I thought, well, he must think I'm trending the right direction. Uh, Harvey's impact on me was profound. He told a story during that revival when he came up that I will never forget. 
Harvey was preaching at his church one Sunday, and he could see his three-year-old son acting up badly. His antics were getting more and more noticeable. People were starting to look at his son, and everybody was looking at his son, and then everybody started looking at Harvey. Harvey finally gave his wife the look. It's the get this kid out of here look. She took Harvey's three-year-old son's hand and began walking up the aisle. Well, apparently, as he was walking up the aisle, he had a moment of clarity. He suddenly realized there was nothing good waiting for him on the other side of that door. (laughs) Not a thing. So he went limp. He went limp and fell on the ground right as she was taking him out, and he began screaming, somebody help a baby! And as the door closed behind him, you could still hear him yelling, somebody help a baby. (laughs) The line still gets used in the house of Bishop. When something's going a certain way, you will occasionally hear someone in my household say, somebody help a baby. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there. We've all experienced the times when Life seemed to be dragging us out the door against our will, and we had a sudden moment of clarity. We've all cried out at some point in our life, somebody help a baby. You know, if I had to categorize the Psalms, there are a lot of different categories. There's Psalms of ascent for going up to Jerusalem. There's Psalms of praise. There's Psalms of lament. But there are somebody help a baby Psalms. When David's just over his head, And if God doesn't help him, he doesn't have a chance. You know, most of us understand that actions have consequences. Bible says we will reap what we sow. We all get that. If you're sowing bad seed, you're gonna reap a bad harvest. I I think we understand that. But it gets a lot harder to get our heads around when we're sowing good seed. And life's still dragging us down the aisle toward the door. We're living righteously, attending church, reading the Bible, giving Offerings, treating people respectfully, hearing and heeding the pings of God, and things still go bad. That's when it's really tough. I think one of the worst pieces of common theology that's floating around these days is the idea that if you're trying to live for God, and if you're riding in the Jesus boat, God owes you calm seas. We don't articulate it, but sometimes when hardship comes our way, we might feel like God isn't holding up his end of the deal. Or maybe we wonder what we're doing to deserve it. So what do you do when you're honestly trying to do everything right and things are still going wrong? I think it's a fair question. Psalm 4 is the account of a process that David works through as he's facing unjust persecution. This psalm offers us a practical way of dealing with difficult times that keeps us on the dance floor even when there is too much racket going on for us to hear the music. This psalm is an opportunity to do things God's way. A lot of you have tried doing things your way, and it didn't work out. It didn't work out. I just want to suggest why not try God's way? Verse one, answer me when I call to you, O God, who declares me innocent. Free me from my troubles. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. This is a declaration of innocence. There are other times in life when David was just dumber than a bag of hammers. He, He made all kinds of mistakes and he paid for those, but this isn't one of them. In this particular instance, with this particular issue, David is innocent. And it is established that whatever he's going through in this text is not the consequences of his own indiscretions. It's an occurrence of bad things happening to good people. And I just want to say that bad things happen to good people. Even when you're trying to do everything right, things can still go wrong. The first thing that we see here is that David goes directly to God. It's his first place that he goes How much in our lives would change if the first place we went was to 
God. If you have a question for God, I just want to throw something really radical out. Why don't you ask God? If you have a question for God, why don't you ask God? A while back, someone approached me and uh, they said, I've got a, a question I've been meaning to ask you. Well, they asked me a really tough question and I answered it. And I said, wasn't that easy? Because what a lot of people do is they have tough questions. They leave the blank or the, they leave the space blank and then they fill it in with something and it's wrong. Guys, God can handle your questions because God is real and things that are real can handle our questions. You got a question for God? Ask God. For many Christians, asking God seems to be the last resort. Prayer seems to be the last resort. But it should be the very first place that we return. Now, there are four positions here, and I'm going to kind of equate those to warm-ups before a workout. Warm-ups before a workout. I know Ken Griffey Jr. said he never warms up before playing baseball because cheetahs never stretch before chasing down their prey, but this isn't that. All right. This is kind of a warm-up, getting us aligned with God to the place that we are ready to pray. Five petitions. Number one, answer me when I call. This is an appeal for a response. Dear God, I'm bearing my heart out to you. Answer me. The Bible says a broken and a contrite heart God will not turn away from. Some of you may be thinking, I'm going through some really rough times right now. You may be on the worst stretch of highway you've ever been on in your entire life, but I wanna suggest to you if that's true, you may be in the best position to approach God that you ever have been because you're not all full of pride and you're not all full of yourself. You see, we can't go to God when we think we're all that in a bag of communion wafers. We go to God on our knees. We go to God in contrition. And humility, answer me when I call. Number two, declare me innocent. This is an appeal for justice. The only time you want justice is when you're actually innocent. When you're guilty, what do you want? Mercy. Mercy is what you want when you're guilty. Justice is what you want when you're innocent. He says, I'm innocent. Declare me innocent. Number three, free me from my trouble. This is an appeal for deliverance. You ever been in a situation only God could get you out of? Free me from my trouble. And number four, have mercy on me. This is an appeal to the loving compassion of God. My wife, Melissa, uh, loves dogs. And almost every day, she'll show me two or three pictures of a dog from a stray rescue somewhere. Uh, the dogs, a lot of times, come in and they're really in pathetic shape. And, and horrible things have happened to them. And, and she, she loves to follow their journeys to restoration. And when she sees these and when she shows them to me, you just have compassion on these animals. Why? Because we're warm human beings. You know, a lot of people say everything's bad in the world. No, not everything's bad in the world. There's good in all of us. And, and we have compassion on things. And some things make us sad and they break our heart. We see something broken, we want to fix it. We see something hurting, we want to help. Well, it's just part of the very best of who we are. And David's saying, if humans have compassion for things, how much more does God have compassion for us? He loves you. He cares about what you're going through. He runs to us. And then finally, hear my prayer. This is an appeal for intervention. God, the reason I'm coming to you is because I believe you can do something about this. Did you know any prayer is an act of faith? When you pray, you're first of all saying, I believe there's a God. You're second of all saying, I believe that God cares about me. And you're thirdly saying, I believe that God is powerful enough to act on my behalf. Every prayer is an act of faith. He says, hear my prayer. All right, now he's all stretched, right? Boom, he's ready to go, he's feeling good. Now he's gonna make his petitions. He's gonna call out his enemies. He's gonna voice his complaints. Here are his complaints. Number one, there is a damage to my reputation 
Verse two, how long will you people ruin my reputation? Once a word is articulated, it takes on a life of its own. I'm gonna say that one more time. Once a word is articulated, it takes on a life of its own. Sometimes we say things in anger. And we say, well, I didn't mean that. Of course you did. You meant it then because you were mad. When you're calm, you don't mean it, and you don't talk like that. How many of you have said things in your life you really wish you could have back? I'm in a situation where I, I love the St. Louis Cardinals, but I like the radio broadcast better than I like the television broadcast, but I like to watch the picture. I'm picky. So I decided one day I was going to turn off the sound on the TV and I was gonna turn on the sound on the radio. There's just enough of a delay that it's annoying. <laughs> it just didn't work. It just didn't work, just enough of a delay. Don't you wish there was a delay in between the time you said things and they stuck? Five second delay. Anything you say for five seconds, you could take it back. Boy, wouldn't that be something? And all you had to do is go like this, and back it goes. You say something really dumb, ba 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 ba. Nobody heard it. Perfect. Life isn't like that. Man, I would have used that five second delay at times during my life. I remember when Melissa and I were first married. Where's Melissa? When we were first married. There we go. There we go. I see her now. All right. When we were first married, uh, I had a job interview. And I had some Levi's Dockers. Do they still make Levi's Dockers? All right. Well, I had some. I mean, I had to save up for Levi's Dockers, right? So I had some Levi's Dockers. I said, would you mind ironing these for me before my interview? She said, absolutely. So she ironed them. Everything was laid out. I put the pants on. This leg had no creases. This leg had two creases that kind of ran this direction. And I said to her, in some countries, they put one crease in the middle of both legs. If I would have had a five second delay, I would not have had to iron my own clothes for the last 40 years. <laughs> and that is gospel truth, and it's why Melissa is a legend. <laughs> Once the words come out, you can't get them back. You know, a lot of times we slander people because we're lazy or because we're insecure. We, we pass things along. We don't know that they're true. We just pass them along, and those words, once they're spoken, they damage people, and they hurt people. And let me be real honest. Even if something is true, doesn't mean you need to say it. How many things have you passed along on social media, and they just ended up not being true? You ever get all upset about something and found out it wasn't true at all? Uh... David says, words are damaging my reputation. Number two, false accusations. He says, how long will you make groundless accusations? These are accusations that are made without substance. And even the people making them know they have no substance. These are things that are just being done to harm, and it's evil. If you do something simply to hurt somebody, that's evil. That's not godly. That's what the devil does. That's devil crap. That's not what God does. False accusations. And then number three, perpetual lies. How long will you continue your lies? This really refers to lying as a political strategy. Lying as a political strategy. You know what politicians have figured out? If you lied long enough about anything, first of all, you'll start believing it. And second, some of the people will start believing it too. You know, when you keep lying long enough and you keep lying emphatically enough, when you slander people, some of it's going to stick and you're going to do them great harm. You know, I, I hear preachers preach about all kinds of things, but let's be real honest. What we really like to hear about are all the sins we're not dispositioned to commit. 
If we have no temptation in this area, that's, that's the sin we want preached on because we can yell amen and whatnot. How many sins do you ever, how many sermons do you ever hear on gluttony? Well, here's one on lying. Lying's a sin. It's a straight up sin. And David's saying, liars are attacking me. David is under baseless and unrelenting attack. And you say, well, how can you determine the source of an attack? One thing I always look at is when something's going really bad, is it just a bad business model that's got a little baptismal water on its head? Or is this demonic? And the way I really identify what's demonic is if there's smoke everywhere, but there's no fire. That's how the devil works. Smoke everywhere, but there's no fire. You get down to it, and there's nothing there. That is a demonic attack. Well, appeal made, David. Now does something some of you need to do. He leaves justice in the hands of the Lord. Over the years, I've had times when I was under baseless attack. There wasn't a thing I could do about it. I learned to tell God how I felt. And I have a prayer that I pray. Dear God, I pray that you would defend me. And I pray that you would avenge me. Yes, I got a little Old Testament in me. And while you're at it, I need to offload this burden to you because it's too heavy for me to carry anymore. Some of you have been carrying pain for a long time. I just want to tell you, maybe today's the day you offload it. Leave it in the hands of the Lord. It's just too heavy. It's just too heavy to carry anymore. Sometimes we got to say, Lord, I'm just going to have to leave this with you because it's tearing me apart. But I trust you to take care of things. You know, the key to salsa living is to state your case to God, to leave the avenging to him, and he promises he'll do it, and then just leave it in his hands. The gospel writer wrote, take your burdens to the altar and leave them there. I think sometimes we bring all of our pain to the altar and we sit and we pray and we pick our pain up and we take it right back to the seat with us. Leave it with God. So if you just need to let go, you've, you've been hurting long enough. You've carried this long enough. Leave it with God. Let it go and move on. Then during times of attack, we have to lean into our core. When everything blows apart around us, we have to lean into our core. Courage comes from our core values. It comes from what is inside of us. I'm not talking about false bravado, and I'm not talking about Facebook courage and Twitter courage where people that got all these things to say because they're hiding in their basement and will never have to face anybody. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real courage. Courage comes from our inner core. So David is going to state two foundational beliefs here, and I love this. Number one, the Lord sets apart the godly for himself. When I was a kid, we used to sing a song. It wasn't one of the catchier songs, but it's called His Banner Over Me is Love. Does anybody remember the song? It was quite horrible, really, I thought. But uh, it had a verse in it that I really, really liked. It said, I am my beloved's, and he is mine. We're God's. A few years ago, I was coming back, I think from a trip from Honduras, and they'd broken my, my luggage. It looked like they'd dropped it out of a helicopter. I mean, it was, just, it was just horrible. I'm sitting there waiting, and I let it pass about 10 times because I didn't recognize it as mine. And, uh, and finally, I, I looked, and, and there it was. I mean, it just looked like 20 elephants had sat on it, and, and it, it was horrible. I, I couldn't imagine what happened to my luggage. And, and finally, it just rolls around, and I look, and I saw my name on it, and I thought, oh, and I just pulled it off. And you know what I thought to myself? This is the worst piece of luggage in the history of the world, but it is mine. We're God's. We don't always get it right. Sometimes it looks like somebody dropped us out of a helicopter. Sometimes it looks like 20 elephants sat on us. Sometimes we don't have things together at all. And we're just busted up and beat up. God just looks at us. He goes, yeah, I know, but it, it, you're mine. And he just pulls us out and takes us with us. He'll put us back together again. We are set apart 
for God. We are uniquely God's. And then number two, that God will answer when I call to him. He'll answer when I call to him. You got grandparents, great-grandparents, parents, you got little kids, if they're in distress, you run to them when they call to you because your heart is with them. And even when your kids aren't little anymore, you still run to them because you love them and they're a part of you. You are a part of God. You're a part of God's family. He loves you. He is responsive to you. God is not up there doing other things disinterested in your life And I know it's hard to get your head around that the creator of heaven and earth actually cares about you when so many people right here on earth that you think should don't. But God's not like them. God cares for us. He set us apart for himself. He's got his name on our name tag. And he will answer when we call to him. Now Psalm 4 gets really, really practical. He gives us five things to do in the uncomfortable space between praying for deliverance and receiving deliverance, all right? The uncomfortable, it's horrible space between praying for deliverance and waiting on deliverance. These are five instructions. Don't let sin, don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. Offer sacrifices in the right spirit and trust the Lord. So let's look at five instructions for the in-between. Some of you are in the in-between right now. You've prayed for God's deliverance. It hasn't come yet, right? That's where you are. So five instructions if we're gonna do things God's way. Number one, keep calm. Just keep calm. Hold her steady. Verse four, don't let anger control you. When life seems unfair and you're in a tight place, don't get feeling sorry for yourself. Don't be like an untied balloon and just all over the place. Don't do that. Cut it out. You ever looked in the mirror and just told yourself to cut it out? Stop it. Stop it. Pull yourself together. Jesus told a story about a house built on rock and a house built on sand. You remember the parable? Storms come. House on sand is washed away. House on rock stands. Big theme, build on the rock. Sub theme, no matter where you build, storms will come. No matter where you build, storms are gonna come, storms are gonna come. Can I quote a little Dylan? Don't fall apart on me tonight. Don't fall apart during the storms. Hold it, calm. Choose to hold steady. Number two, get distance between impulse and action. People who make really bad decisions have no distance between impulse and action. How many of you often your first impulse is quite terrible? Yeah. I remember when the kids were home and we were raising kids, whatever my first impulse was, was almost always wrong. It was just almost always wrong. So after a while, you just sort of learn, whatever that is, I just need to sit on it. I need to hold steady. I need to get distance between what I want to do and what I ought to do. I need to get a little distance. Sleep on it. Never act. Can we quote Casey the eye care cat before you take the time to think? When difficult times come, prayer must become the buffer between what we feel and what we do. How many of you could have saved yourself a really bad situation at some point in your life if you would have created some space between your impulse and your action? Prayer's the buffer. We need to pray until we have peace and calmness and clarity and sense God's direction. Decisions made in haste will always tear stuff up. And then even when everything's right, you're still gonna have to tear up all the, or repair all the extra stuff you tore up. There's just no, no, nothing good comes of it. So get distance between impulse and action. Number three, can I, can I throw a Southern phrase at you? Shut my mouth. We just need to shut our mouths and still our fingers. It just says be silent. When you're frustrated, aggravated, and disappointed, keep your mouth shut and stay away from computers. Can I just hear an amen from somebody? <laughs> Things are gonna come out of your mouth that are far stronger than you'd wish to say in regular times. And you can't get them back. You just can't get them back. 
I wonder how many relationships would be saved if people could remain silent during times of anger and frustration. Today at one o'clock, we've got a last recruitment meeting for our Israel-Egypt pilgrimage that we're gonna take in January. And one of the things I tell everybody who goes on pilgrimages with me is this. We are in the Middle East. It's not exactly like traveling around here. Stuff can happen here and there. But when it does, I need you to associate frustration with silence. We are fully aware things are not going great. We're working on it. And your frustration only makes things worse. When we get frustrated and then speak and act, that's when the bad stuff happens. So shut your mouth and still your fingers. Number four, give sacrificially. I love this because it's counterintuitive. Verse five, offer the right sacrifices. Often when we get, go through tough stretches, our focus gets upon ourselves. We become the sun of our solar system and we expect all the planets and moons to revolve around us. And then we get all hurt when it doesn't happen. The account of Job reminds us that healing and restoration often comes when we turn our attention toward others. Job was restored when he prayed for his friends. Giving is allowing God to flow from us and to use our financial and our human resources and direct them toward the betterment of others. The best thing you can do for yourself if you're going through a tough time is serve others. Number five, have a little faith. It just says trust in the Lord. Now, biblical trust means to have absolute confidence in a thing. Let me give you a baseball example. Paul Goldschmidt, the first baseman for the Cardinals, is having like the best season imaginable so far. The guy is really, really good. And every time he gets up in a clutch situation or a non-clutch situation, I have pretty good confidence that good things are gonna happen. And yet, even with that being said, six out of 10 times, the man's not gonna get on base. He's not gonna get on base. Six out of 10 times, he is going to fail in his efforts to get a hit or to get a walk or to reach base in some way. I've got some trust in Paul Goldschmidt, but if he doesn't come through, it doesn't really bother me. I'm still trying to make the TV on and the radio on and get it all to sync. It's not gonna bother me if Goldschmidt doesn't come through. This isn't that kind of trust. This is the kind of trust a paratrooper has in a parachute. We gotta trust God like that. God, if you don't come through, I'm gonna splat on the ground. That is the kind of trust it's talking about. Trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Now, if we're obedient to these five in-between instructions, the psalmist says we get five responses from God. I'm gonna move quickly through these. Here we go. It says, many people say, who will show us better times? Let your face smile on us, Lord. This is just an appeal for better days. So let me read chat, verse seven, and then let's hit these five things. You have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvests of grain and new wine. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O oh Lord, will keep me safe. Five things. This is what God will do for you if you do things his way. Number one, better days are coming. Verse six, God will bring better times. My friends, the storms of life do not last forever. And even if they last forever in this life, they will not follow you to eternity with God. How often in our life when we're surrounded by the hurricane, does a beam of heavenly sunlight shine out just to remind us that God is with us. Maybe it's a lesson you hear in student ministry that reminds you in the worst time that God is with us. Maybe a, a sermon, maybe a card, maybe a call from a friend, an act of kindness in the midst of the storm can be ever-present reminders that God's with us. That's why when God pings you to reach out to other people, even if it's to send a card or send a text of encouragement, you've got to do that because it's not about you, it's about them. God knows they need encouragement right now and he's pinging you to do it. That's why we've gotta move through. Better days will come, bad times do not last forever. Number two, favor with God. It says God will shine upon us. God is never more proud of us than when we remain faithful and trusting and strong 
during times of crises. And your most powerful witness will be when you remain faithful and trusting and strong during times of crises. When everybody knows what we're going through and we hold fast in God, God's favor shines upon us. God's favor is upon us. Number three, perpetual joy. You give me great joy. I I just love this. Joy in the Bible isn't happiness. Happiness is predictable response to favorable stimuli. That's what happiness is. It's Good things on the outside trying to work their way in. Joy is a byproduct of a life that is in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Joy starts on the inside and works its way out. We can have joy all of the time, regardless of our circumstances. He will give us perpetual joy. Number four, he'll give us rest. It says, I will lie down and sleep in peace. A troubled mind produces sleepless nights. And I don't want to be uh, caustic here, but a lot of it, when you can't sleep, turn your TV on and you watch stuff that isn't going to help you any. We need to get God into us. We need to get wholesome things into us. We need to get the word of God into us. You know, Don mentioned that Joshua Gillum just uh, released a new EP. I downloaded that the second it came out. And, and, and as I came to work today, I, I, I did a mix between Josh Gillum and the Bee Gees from the late 60s. We went kind of back and forth. It was a little weird, but it worked for me. <laughs> but when you can't sleep, invite God in. The Bible says God gives his beloved ones rest. Lean into that rest. Melissa tells me that she has systematically removed everything from her life that disturbs her peace. I just want to suggest, why don't you start removing things that disturb your peace? And then number five, security. You will keep me safe. The final response of God to obedience is that we live in security. Our soul is secure. Our heart is secure. Our mind is secure. We can find true security in the Lord. We're invincible When we realize that, if you know your soul is protected by God, if you know your eternity in heaven is sealed, what in the world would you or me have to fear? The worst medical prognosis will not change the destination of your soul. The thing you fear most happening in your life will not change the destination of your soul. I saw a newscast yesterday, uh, I guess the airplane had crashed in the Ozarks in 1973, and they interviewed this elderly man who survived the crash, one of six people to survive the crash. They said, how has that crash impacted your life? He said, you know, when you've survived something like that, not much else worries you. And I just want to say, when you rest in the Lord, when you do things his way, not much else is going to worry you. So let me ask a question. What comes out of you when your world seems to be falling apart? Does faith and hope and power well up in you? Or does fear and despair and anxiety rob you of all your strength and your courage and your joy? And if you don't like what is coming out, maybe you need to change your inputs. Maybe you need to try to do things God's way. And he's outlined it so clearly here. The next time distress finds your front steps, and it will, don't panic. Don't send out invitations to the pity party. Refuse to let fear control you. Don't make hasty decisions. Keep your mouth shut and your fingers still. Keep doing the right stuff. And just trust in the Lord like a paratrooper. Trust in their parachute. And if you do, we are promised that better times will come. That God's face will shine upon us. And we will have joy and peace and safety. How can I be so sure? Because I trust in God's word. Not like I trust in my favorite baseball player, but like a paratrooper trusts in a parachute. I am basing my life and my eternity on the word of God. That's what Christians do. I invite you to pray a prayer that's just taken right out of Psalm 4 with me. Let's pray together. Hear my prayer in my innocence. 
relieve my troubles and have mercy on me. Don't allow people to falsely accuse me, lie about me, and ruin my reputation. Give me strength, keep anger from consuming me, and help me know when to be silent. I will worship and trust in you and you alone. I will be faithful in these days of despair and look forward to better days when you again fill my heart with joy, abundance, and safety. I know good things are coming, for I know you are good. In Jesus' strong name, amen. There's gonna be some folks up here, if you would just like someone to pray with you about something you're going through in your life, they would love to do that. Also want to just give this invitation to you. If, if you want to just make a, a stand in your own life, say, I'm going to do things God's way. I've tried my own way. Didn't work out well. I'm going to do things God's way. Come and get one of these red stones. Pop it in that jar. And every Sunday when you come to church, remember the promise that you made on this day. God is so incredibly good. And one of the things I love about the Bible, it gives us a clear path from where we are to where God would have us be. Would you stand as we worship together?
as we get ready to leave this morning, let's remind ourselves of part of our psalm that we read today. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Christ Church, go in peace. Have a great week, and we look forward to worshiping with you again soon.